Good afternoon to one and all present here. Let me introduce our next speaker for this session, Dr. Gopalakrishnan Kumar, sir. He is working as a professor at Institute of Chemistry, Bioscience and Environmental Engineering, Faculty of Science and Technology, University of Stravanger, Norway. Additionally, he plays the role of specially appointed associate professor concentrating on research in the School of Chemical and Environmental Engineering, Yonsei University, South Korea. Prior to these positions, he worked as KRF Fellow, School of Civil, Engin Civil and Environmental Engineering, Yonsei University, and Research Professor in the Department of Environmental Engineering, Daegu University, South Korea. He received his PhD from Chia University, Taiwan. He was recipient of prestigious JSPS Postdoctoral Fellowship and Emilia Rosenbluth Fellowship for his postdoctoral studies. He is also visiting faculty in many universities around Europe, India, Vietnam, China and Turkey. He has extensively published more than 300 SCI papers in highly prestigious journals including 6 cover image articles and 10 highly cited articles and 1 key scientific article with the total citations of more than 10,800 and an impressive H index of 56. He also contributed to more than 20 book chapters and edited 5 books. His major research includes biofuel, biochemical production from lignocellulose, wastewater and algal biomass via biorefinery and valorization schemes and microbial fuel electrolysis cell and, cell and its related technologies. Additionally, he is working on an application of green synthesized activated carbon and nanoparticles for various environmental remediation applications. He also delivered more than 90 speeches in various conferences, seminars and workshops. Besides his academic contribution, he also works as consultant for various international academic and research projects in various universities and industries. I am very happy to have you in this session, sir. I welcome you, sir. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the nice introduction, uh, Arun Kumar. So, uh, good morning, uh, Europe, and uh, uh, good afternoon to India. So, thank you so much. First of all, I would like to express my gratitude to uh, Madhimani, Dr. Madhimani, and uh, Dr. Pugel, and others who I know much more in this uh, faculty development program. And it was a nice because I couldn't join in the, some of the sessions previously since I was involved in another conferences. Uh, but I saw that it was a huge uh, FTB and I saw that more than 200 participants and everything because I was there in the inauguration ceremony and then uh, there was a very widely nice topics and others covered. So it was an excellent uh, organization. So I would like to thank and my sincere gratitude to these organizers. So let me get into this uh, topic of uh, today because I saw that the, this uh, program has a very wide uh, diverse topics on uh, various uh, biorefinery platforms and algal biotechnology and everything. And originally I was uh, trying to focus a bit on algal biotechnology, but then I found that you have had enough in the last uh, uh, three, four days with a lot of algal technologies and everything. So I tried to um, I focus a bit a little bit on the other kind of uh, waste biorefinery schemes so i think yeah so let me get into that so this is um, the university of uh, stavanger so we just uh, try to use this picture to represent uh, ourselves uh, but uh, we don't like it in this university but this is the uh, famous uh, pulpit truck um, that uh, attracts the worldwide recognition i mean anybody thinks about the university of stavanger or norway so they will think about this uh, pulpit truck because of this amazing nature yeah, so but it's also like uh, it looks quite sunny and everything. It was the summer, that's why it looks sunny, but now it's kind of a, a winter. It's morning uh, 10 o'clock and it's still a bit dark outside. So uh, there are some things that I will uh, give introduction about that. Yeah. So uh, just uh, uh, before uh, getting into the real topic, uh, just to try to cheer you guys up or something. So just uh, let me give you a little bit of glimpses about this uh, Norway. I think pretty much many of you guys uh, know about uh, Norway, um, uh, I guess so. But still uh, just uh, trying to give some small uh, introduction about this um, Norway. Uh, Norway was not so rich until 1965-70s and then in 1970s they due to this uh, uh, UK border they got these um, oil resources now and then they are one of the highest exporter of uh, oil and then the um, uh, 
interesting fact about this uh, Norway is that uh, they are the largest uh, exporter of oil, but then at the same time, they don't use much oil inside the country because you see that uh, they have a lot of hydroelectric plants. So it's like around 99% of their energy comes from this hydroelectric power, which is kind of um, renewable. So whatever the oil money they get it due to this export, they just simply invest it. And then uh, as you can see, this Norwegian pension fund is the one of the largest in the world, which is closer to $1.6 trillion by now. This was between 2017, but now it's uh, increasing a lot. So it's one of the uh, biggest uh, public fund uh, which built based on this um, oil economy. So this is the reason, this is the reason that uh, the Norway has become quite rich uh, in these days, actually. So they are the number one in the human development index and uh, everything. So this is just uh, to give you an um, uh, idea about it and also their richness goes much more with their less population so they are about only 5 million people in the whole country and out of 5 million it's like 1.2 million or kind of immigrants not the real Norwegians yeah okay so then uh, I'm just uh, putting this weather about uh, Norway so you no know, it's one of the coldest place in uh, the Arctic place and then this in the north so you can see that the average temperature is around like 10 degrees Celsius Sometimes it's around eight, but it goes varies much more. But then uh, last summer we had quite good uh, summer. We could say it's around 30 degrees, 35 degrees Celsius. It's almost like uh, India or in many Asian countries. So it was really good actually. So uh, why I was just uh, putting this image is uh, basically, you know, I was explaining you that um, Norway is quite uh, cold and then uh, these uh, people are a bit moody, especially their mood changes uh, much more towards the summer because of the sun and uh, kind of like that. But um, uh, basically, many people have a bit of a uh, different opinion because before I'm moving here, it's been my it's my fourth year in Norway. And then uh, before moving here, I also visited uh, two or three times to these uh, Scandinavian countries like uh, Finland as well as uh, Sweden. And I used to believe that the people are very cold because they don't tend to talk much. But then I see that their mood and everything is much more fluctuated based on the um, weather. So uh, usually if you wanted to start a conversation with any Scandinavian people, this is the first topic you could just start. You can just start with the weather. So and then because even themselves um, feel quite interesting to talk a lot about weather because uh, in the same day you can have typically all the climates. In the morning it's uh, very freezy, chilling. And then, you know, sometimes in the summer, uh, the morning the temperature is around minus two. So that's I, I was thinking to put some of this picture, but I couldn't actually. But uh, that's the, how it works actually. So it's very fluctuates a lot and everything. So that's how it's a good topic to talk. But also there are some reasons uh, for this weather and uh, uh, the topic that I'm giving today. So because of this uh, darkness, they also consume a huge amount of um, uh, coffee just to make them brisk and also that uh, coffee is one of the way that uh, they, so they're typically similar like our tea. Uh, so they consume like almost six to seven cups of uh, coffee per day, especially during the winter. It goes sometimes like uh, 10 cups and something like that. They forget even to drink water. So they just simply drink a lot of coffee. So I will give you some uh, topics related to that and uh, how it has been uh, formulated into a research topic uh, in my lab uh, about this coffee waste and stuff like that in the later slides. Yeah. And uh, coming back to the uh, uh, the next one is about this uh, university. So, you know, uh, I work in this uh, University of Stavanger and this university is uh, called uh, this ECIU. So what is the meaning of this ECIU is this uh, European Consortium of Innovative Universities. So that means the motto itself uh, gives you a quite nice idea about it's uh, the challenging the conventional thinking. So the speciality of this uh, university is that this is not a typical university like uh, other places where you have a mixture of uh, different topics, arts and science and everything. But here it is much more focused on this uh, technological challenge based uh, solutions. So what are the major uh, pedagogical model uh, that we use in these uh, universities are uh, basically about this uh, context based learning and adaptive teaching. Basically, these two are mainly we are using and then we also make kind of incidental learning. So, you know, uh, for example, uh, maybe we are talking a little bit about this uh, uh, biomass, biofuel uh, topics in a lecture. And then suddenly, incidentally, or suddenly some of our uh, CEO of a big uh, biofuel company would be entering into the lecture room. Then he will take over the things. So, so that's how the students get to know, you know, how to be prepared for the real world and stuff like so. This is just a... Uh, uh, give you a little bit of idea about these um, uh, what's the way that uh, we used to teach and basically the model uh, that most of the uh, the whole university all the all the faculty especially the faculty of mine uh, environmental engineering follows uh, this one so based on the resources and activity and evaluation and support so race model i think uh, probably you can google it and uh, try to learn much more about it 
So, uh, what is the speciality of this? So, basically, you know, like the, the, there's a huge uh, uh, differences or there's a huge gap uh, between this academia and industry because academia is a place where the innovation comes and the industry is the place where it needs actually. But uh, many places it actually misses. And I think uh, even in India now, uh, there's a lot of things coming around uh, for this aspect that they wanted to push more about these uh, uh, business incubators and others to, to try to think more about this uh, innovation moving to industry. So that has been already implemented in this university model. So what we do is that uh, probably whatever the courses we teach, for example, you see, we are just trying to teach about this uh, green production chemistry, where we teach a lot about these, you know, uh, uh, biopolymers or so on. So and those will be uh, involved in some companies, actually. So these companies will give a talk or even we try to develop the topics which the company actually need because every time the industry has a huge problems right so we try to develop the courses or the modules based on that so i'm just going to give you an example of that how do we develop the model so these are all the um, 12 uh, universities in this uh, ECIU members and the uh, point that we made it is it's the same for applied for example in stavanger is the capital of oil and gas industry so many of the uh, issues related to the oil and gas industry are the topics of this university so if you, if it's a business development program, MBA degree, and then it mainly focuses on how to manage the oil resources and kind of like that. And in terms of in environmental engineering, we try to tend to teach a lot of topics related to wastewater treatment or the solid waste uh, treatment that comes around from these um, uh, regions and kind of like that. So that is the same in other universities as well. So, for example, in this Tampere University in Finland, where this Tampere mainly focuses a lot about this mining because this area is much more related to the mining. So they give, try to develop the courses and even the develop the programs related to these mining issues. So the, what happens is the students uh, get to know the industry very well and they also try to learn the topics which actually becomes much more skilled entrepreneurs, you know, to work on these industries and stuff like that rather than thinking about more broader view of this theoretical aspect and then thinking further about into the application aspects of it. Yeah. Yeah. So and then uh, the another point that we try to implement in all our courses is about these uh, sustainable development goals, because I think I don't need to explain much more about this um, sustainable development goals. So any of our course, if you are taking and it will try to cover up at least two to three uh, sustainable development goals. So we try to tend to cover up all these uh, goals so that the students much more understand towards what is these and then how do we think or develop much more into a sustainable manner because um, we are we have to also teach them that the sustainable development is the major factor that drives the whole world and they have to think much more towards uh, developing any new technology that should not lead like you know a uh, problem to the environment and everything that has to be a sustainable and also it has to be green to the earth and environment so yeah recently in 2019 so they have been awarded this uh, best model of, for teaching or even for the universities and even i think a lot of uh, uh, indian private universities are contacting us uh, for example srm and vit many of these institutes are also in uh, contact with us to try to implement this model with them for some of the programs and stuff like that so yeah it's a challenge based learning and innovation as i told you that uh, most of our uh, courses are kind of uh, given as a challenge so I'm just going to give you some of our courses. So for example, you can see that this is a construction industry, right? So we try to have a course which says about this mapping the construction, recyclable, reusable, and renewable material. So what is the major problem with this construction industry? Because they are the largest polluter of uh, carbon dioxide. So how do we reuse them or how do we uh, abate this um, carbon dioxide and so on, so something like that. And then we try to also food waste and kind of other. So these are all the course modules, just I'm trying to give you a little bit about it. So as I was selling that, this is the impact is very important actually so we also try to tend to deliver much more on these micro modules so that's where they try to learn much more into very detailed about the skills that they needed so this is one of my course that i'm giving on this bioenergy so what is it and then uh, it's a micro module so you can see the major learning outcomes is about like you know these are all the things and then you can see that aspen plus is one of the software and then the fermentation and nrb digestion right so these are all the major process so you can see that it starts in february and then finishes in june like it's in a three months but it's a very tight course and then we also try to teach this within connection with some other universities that are already listed as ECIU. So because the um, uh, fact is that that uh, students who is taking the course in Norway could also transfer their credits and others to the another ECIU university so that they don't lose any year or any of their education. So this is one of the ideas. So this is just to give a little bit about 
uh, advertise much about my university and stuff. And then uh, it is also an opportunity for uh, future faculty exchange or even some student exchange in the future if some people are interested. So let's uh, get into the topic of uh, today. So waste biorefinery. Why did I choose uh, this topic? If you getting into the world and see what are the sorry, what are the major problems that we are facing, and then in 2050 that we also face uh, quite a lot is majorly goes into energy, uh, food safety and security and environment. But if you are just thinking about all these uh, main sectors, most of them are also going into this uh, word cloud. I think it's quite small, but you could still see. That the major thing is going into the recycling and the energy saving methodologies or technologies and also the organic food. So these are all the major things that we have to mainly uh, focus as well on this uh, uh, in order to solve this problem. So uh, in this case, I just tried to give a little bit about uh, bioeconomy or bioenergy. So I think the bioenergy uh, fits into various uh, sustainable development goals. As I was mentioning also, this is a part of my course that I've been teaching so that, you know, we do a lot of um, uh, topics related to the bioenergy. And then slowly now, I think uh, we also not to focus mainly on the energy resources. And we also try to move into economical um, aspects of it. Why? I, I gave you an explanation in the um, first two slides in my presentation that Norway is quite rich already in energy because they have a huge amount of energy that they are exporting even though they finish up with the oil quite quickly or probably soon but still they could actually have this uh, hydroelectric power so that's why producing bioenergy is not that much of interest to them but still there are some companies and others that are working on the bioenergy but then now what they are focusing is much more towards this uh, bioeconomy so how do we move into that direction or like more uh, value added chemicals and everything so that's what I'm going to talk a little bit in the future slides yeah. So uh, based on this, you know, basically, as I said, that our university is much more or even our department is much more towards a strategic oriented, actually. So we try to keep up a strategy. What is going to what we are going to work and kind of like that. So this is the IKBM Institute of Chemistry, Bioscience and Environmental Engineering. And then the majorly we try to focus on two topics. One is One Health and another one is the circular economy. I think the circular economy, many of the professors have given the talk in the previous slides, but I will also try to give from our perspective about this uh, circular economy. And then also we focus uh, slightly into this uh, One Health actually. Just to give you a bit of idea about this One Health is a very recently nourished buzzword or a topic where uh, uh, it includes all the health of everybody. I mean, like it's a human health, environmental health and animal health because these are all kind of interrelated. So I will not go much into details, but I will give a few informations in the end of the presentation. But uh, majorly today's presentation or even the things that we are focusing is much more on this circular economy. I think many of you know what is circular economy and it is just mainly uh, promoting about the sustainability with uh, well balanced of uh, in uh, technology and environment and also in the economy. For example, the as I said that Norway is also much more focusing on this oil economy, but then you know it's not really sustainable because you are digging down a lot and creating a huge environmental problem. So how do we develop a sustainable technologies? So that's what mostly about this circular economy are trying to increase the overall value of any product or the life cycle of uh, that particular technology yeah so uh, why do we get into that so i think yeah the first problem is that uh, because a lot of the society now is mainly uh, money driven uh, society so they just try to tend to go into the technologies uh, that are not sustainable and uh, it is actually already getting into a lot of problems that uh, we already know that uh, be a huge amount of co2 and i think the ipcc also mainly trying to suggest to reduce the global average temperature, you know, a little bit like less than three degrees Celsius and stuff. And recent uh, Glasgow agreement happened in uh, last June, I guess. Yeah, in Glasgow. So they also mainly focused on this. And that's why now they are pushing much more towards a lot of uh, low low cost technology on this CO2 and others. And uh, as you can see that the bioenergy can take a very good uh, leading role, but they basically they are trying to focus much more on the renewables. So you can see that uh, Makes maximum like they are trying to increase into 65% of the um, uh, world renewable uh, energy, but then uh, the around like 13% uh, counts for this bioenergy. I think I'm not sure about the number I, that's in the next slides coming around it. Yeah, yeah, here. So they are just mainly trying to focus much more on this, uh, trying to doubling the overall bioenergy. 
it's mainly needed for this uh, global energy transition. So as you can see that uh, now the 48% of the final renewable energy that has been targeted in uh, 2030, and they are just trying to increase into 40% in 2050. And uh, it is also trying to limit, you know, the global temperature less than two degrees Celsius. So these are all the major things that are uh, focusing on. So in this case, uh, as I said, uh, we also try to focus a bit on waste to energy. Uh, that was the concept that we have been working until 2020. But then now from 2020 uh, to 20, 2030, for the next 10 years, our strategy is mainly much more focusing towards the circular economy. So whereas we are just also trying to think about more on the resource recovery rather than just simply focusing on the energy aspects of it. Yeah, I'm just uh, trying to give an example here how this uh, resource recovery concepts can be applied. For example, you can see this uh, food waste. Uh, originally, we were focused much more on either trying to produce hydrogen or methane. That was the major idea. But then now trying to implement into different processes and trying to recover as much as possible from a uh, different fractions. You know, like uh, I will tell in details when I go into the food waste biorefinery about this part. This is just to give you an example. Yeah, just uh, if uh, some of you not know, I'll try to give a bit introduction about this um, uh, circular economy. So the first one is uh, the linear economy. This is what the adapted economy that we have been following for a long time. And then the around 60s and 70s, the recycling has come. And then we started to uh, do a lot of uh, recycling. And But I think it is also not much uh, well regulated with the recycling. Uh, for example, it is well regulated in Norway because one of the things is that uh, they have a scheme are called the uh, pun scheme and uh, this actually gives a very nice uh, recycling option because for example anything that you are buying in the supermarket for example a coca-cola bottle or coca-cola or pepsi or whatever the case and then it comes with an additional price so what happens is once you consume the drink inside then you have to give back this to this uh, supermarket then you get that money back so that's how the people think that, you know, that's why the Norway is one of the leading example of 98% of this uh, plastic recycling is because of that, because the plastic is a money. And I think it is also coming into India, but I think implementing such a case in India is a bit harder because the population is quite less. It was quite good. But I think still there is a possibility of doing that because uh, many people think that doesn't have a value. That's why it's uh, ended up in landfill and so on. So kind of like that. So that has been taking into until 80s and 90s. It was quite good. And then, then recently, I think in the, I think, in 2000s, uh, it started to think more about circular economy because we are also thinking about recycling. But then we are also trying to think about some more raw materials in order to get into the production so that we can try to use some of the recycled materials so that, you know, the overall value of that particular raw material or virgin material is increasing into a certain extent, actually, so that we don't tend to use a lot of virgin materials. You know, we can still use a lot of this uh, recycling material. That's how it closes the loop and it looks a bit like a circular. So that's why people think about circular economy. But the basic idea of the circular economy is just trying to expand the life cycle or the value of the particular the material for a longer time. So, yeah. Now, so based on this, that uh, the strategy for the University of Stavanger, as I said, that uh, we are just mainly focusing on the green shift. It's called uh, Grunholm Sterling, and then measure as one health and also these um, the circular economy. This is the two things that we will be focusing mainly on the next uh, ten years. So just uh, getting into the topic a little, so you can see that it was uh, a bit old from last year, uh, October 2020. I didn't get uh, for this year uh, because uh, in uh, Norway there is a scheme uh, called like a waste deposit. So that means like um, they try to keep a kind of a bank where you can deposit your waste and stuff so that, you know, it is all counted so that they can know exactly how much the waste is generated, what is the treatment option and um, how is it going and kind of like that. So in this case, um, yeah, you can see that, like, you know, as I was mentioning in the beginning, the Norwegian population is uh, closer to like uh, five point or six million closer to that. But then they also tend to waste, uh, try to produce some more similar waste, almost five point eight million tons of waste that has been produced uh, in 2018. Uh, for example, uh, if you're just also uh, calculating into the account uh, in, uh, to, yeah, and the, another uh, calculation is saying about this 11.82 million tons, which overall, because the previous one was only about this uh, combustible waste and now it's gone uncombustible and everything. So if you're just checking out it, the interesting factor is that, okay, we already know that the manufacturing industries or construction industries then to produce more waste because of the process and it is an industry actually. But the fact is that even households tend to produce, you can see from here, it is about 2.4 million tons. So now it was quite interesting for us because even the households try to produce the same amount of waste. So we were just a bit... Uh, 
surprised to see that actually that uh, what is it yeah. and also it is kind of a stable you can see that it is kind of a stable but you can see the others like they are just changing right from 2017 to 18 you can see these manufacturing industries now they are like uh, trying to reduce that's why it's a factor of minus three and then uh, minus five from construction so they try to tend to recycle a lot so that was the reason that they are going down but then if you see the households they are just remaining the same so then we got a bit uh, interesting to know and then that's why we ended up with this uh, coffee waste is also one of the uh, huge amount of waste that produced and also food waste in kind of that that i will come into a case study later on so uh, based on this that uh, we started to think much more about this uh, what are the key research areas that we could develop in norway and uh, go towards to that and then uh, you see that um, uh, environmental and bioremediation and algal biotechnology and biomass fertilization to chemicals these are the major topics that we are focusing but as i mentioned this we also focus slightly on the bioenergy production but that's not that much interesting but then today we will try to focus a bit on this biomass fertilization and others so based on this idea, uh, my lab has been established as uh, ESNL. It's called Energy and Sustainability Nexus uh, Laboratory. And uh, where, what we do a lot is about this. We try to focus on wastewater and solid waste treatment. Uh, the major target is about sustainable resource recovery. And uh, what we do, what are the applied tools? We do a lot of statistics and uh, modeling on the NASPOL as uh, we focus on the green chemistry and applied microbiology in order to understand the process. And um, uh, this is my lab website, Energy and Sustainability Nexus Laboratory. You can just uh, Google it so you can get to know a lot of uh, activities that we do within this area. And this, and then you can yeah, uh, contact me further for the uh, future collaborations or something. So when we are just thinking about this uh, biorefinery, and I think uh, it is just uh, an introduction about the uh, uh, similar to the petroleum refinery. Yeah, you can see, I think the petroleum refinery gives a lot of, uh, or not only the oil, but also a lot of uh, various uh, byproducts. And then uh, this is the same with the biorefinery as well. Instead of this um, oil as a feedstock, or this is a crude oil as a feedstock, we can try to put a lot of uh, biomass, for example, grasses, lignin cellulose, or agricultural residues, and then they will try to give a lot of different uses. And the major focus was on the fuels or energy in the beginning, but then now it is moving much more into the chemicals and as well as the food and feed for animals or even for humans actually. So getting into the topic about this waste biorefinery. So what is waste biorefinery? So I think you already got to know about bit about waste. What is the waste? And then also a little bit about what is the concept of biorefinery. So why the waste biorefinery is very much uh, needed actually, because you know the, now the world is uh, facing a lot of challenges because if you are just checking the top 10 problems now, probably in uh, 15 years ago, kind of like that. It was mainly on terrorism and others and uh, energy and something like that. But now it goes much more into the waste because we are, as you can see, this is statistics about like um, in 2013, we are about 7.2 billion, but then around 2050, we are going to be 9.6 billion people, but probably it might get reduced a little bit because of a COVID pandemic or kind of like that. But still, we are having a very high projected values uh, in uh, 2050. So that is a huge substantial growth on the overall globe. So we cannot really uh, hold those people. But another problem is that they generate a huge amount of waste, actually. So how do we manage these waste? So that's why it's becoming more and more um, threat or very uh, different topic. And um, if you're considering a lot of, uh, I mean, out of these, uh, the huge population rises in mostly in the uh, emerging or developing economies. Who doesn't have... Uh, much well, uh, what to say, like uh, uh, sustainable disposal of waste. So they are in still in fancy stage because in a lot of uh, Western world or in a developed country, it is uh, kind of uh, regulated a bit. As I shown you that uh, we even have a waste deposit accounts where we can know how much the waste is generated and everything in Norway. But whereas, for example, in India and others, or even Pakistan or many emerging economies, we are still working on it. We, there are a lot of policies and everything coming, but it is also the uh, people's mindset. So we could see that, that a lot of waste is still ending up in the landfill. So at least we can try to develop something with the landfill, but still, you know, that's not sustainable. So, but if you're thinking it in another manage, you know, if you're thinking it that, I mean, we should not say waste is a waste anymore because I think waste is considered as a resource now because, you know, it is a huge resources of uh, renewable carbon and other materials and everything. So we have to think about it in a different manner to how do we use the resource into recover various products and everything. 
So now, uh, yeah, the waste biorefineries is a bit complicated. Why? It's because of this uh, uh, the huge diversified uh, sources, and as well as you know, it involves in a multiple process and everything because many of them are biological process. So the biological system works in a different manner. So this is what. So and then, but I think the people are working, and then the researchers are working in order to make some innovative and other approaches to make this waste biorefinery as a quite a adaptable model or quite a suitable model for the future. So a few examples of these uh, waste biorefineries. I think the municipal waste biorefinery, where you can see a lot of uh, the household waste and others are getting into the one, not much industries, but you know, like this construction waste, demolition waste, or even like a cardboards. Um, plastics and the sewage and so on so but then you go into the animal waste where much more comes from the farming farming and everything but they also reach in you know like a fats and uh, many things and i think meat industry is one of the huge i think it's also uh, problematic in uh, norway i will give a case a bit later if i have time and then a uh, forest waste but i think this is well suitable for even india because uh, india is a huge uh, land of agricultural things so that there's a huge amount of uh, forestry waste also comes and agricultural waste and then the industrial waste whereas it goes much more into the industry but i think the industry has a uh, quite good regulations but i think it's also coming in other countries and as well as actually so the major technologies that uh, adapted for these uh, biorefinery things or this uh, fermentation mrb digestion pyrolysis incineration gasification the last 3 years mainly into the thermal way of uh, treating them and the first two are more of less into the biological way of treating uh, these waste yeah okay then uh, yeah as i mentioned like we will focus only on this uh, biotechnological intervention so what is the need of this biotechnology but i think yeah the biotechnology can do a lot of uh, magic a lot of things and then uh, you see that um, yeah the biotechnological tools uh, will uh, play a huge role in the future on this uh, uh, shaping the biorefinery schemes, actually. So India has a huge potential. From this slide, you can see that, OK, yeah, it could, yeah the energy consumption is to keep on increasing. In 2035, it may go up to 780 etajoules. It's quite huge. And then the uh, India has a huge potential for not only bioenergy generation, but also biorefinery schemes. So it may keep on increasing. And I think in the future, it will increase yeah, more than 5% onto that. So. Uh, when getting into that uh, topic, uh, what I did was that, okay, I try to classify the biomass uh, sometimes. So, so it's basically into three types of uh, biomass. We can divide them, the one I shown you in the previous slides and stuff. So mainly we can say it as a high potential waste biomass, medium potential and low potential. But it is categorized only based on the energy content. So if you're really thinking about moving towards uh, bioenergy, and I think these are all the major uh, three most categories that uh, we are making. But you can see that, uh, for example, in high potential waste biomass, we try to put a lot of biomass and the food waste and the biomedical waste. Why? Because they have a huge amount of carbon, which can be directly contributing to the huge amount of energy. And the uh, medium potential is called like a cow tang and uh, other kind of things, and also even agricultural residues, because they also need a lot of uh, pre-treatment and others to get it into that. And low potential, yeah, oh, sorry, I think the medium potential is more into agricultural because it's a like but the low potential goes into manual because the manual has a huge amount of uh, nitrogen and potash but then it can be converted into a uh, other kind of uh, fertilizers and stuff so uh, when you are thinking about this uh, biotechnological intervention of uh, those the major things we can focus on with uh, agriculture which is basically a kind of uh, lignus cellulose i think we will get to know about it a bit later but what are the major uh, process that could be involved in this is this um, uh, three different processes one is the separate hydrolysis and fermentation because as i was mentioning the lignocellulose has a huge amount of uh, lignin and cellulose fraction so in order to get the cellulose fraction we need to apply a hydrolysis process and everything yeah so this is one shf and then uh, yeah it, 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 a lot of enzymes and everything and then the second one is simultaneous saccharification and fermentation whereas we try to develop some kind of a bacterial and others which I will um, give a little bit of example in the lactosinous biorefinery. Here, just to introduce about what are the different processes, the biotechnological process that can be employed. So SHF, SSF, and then, yeah, this is the difference. So, for example, we can try to compare this saccharification and fermentation to one unit so that we can further get into that. And, uh, yeah, ethanol was the main product because it was meant for this uh, bioenergy. Yeah, this is the difference, actually. And then uh, recently, I think um, the people also started to focus more on this uh, SSCF, the simultaneous saccharification and co-fermentation, whereas they try to 
uh, co-ferment a different kind of sugars because before they were trying to ferment only the hexo sugars and the ben, uh, yeah hexo sugars are pentose sugars separately but then now they're trying to mix together so that you know it can get a much more optimal values and stuff like that so this is uh, one and then the final one is the consolidated bioprocessing this is the major core tool of uh, biorefinery that we could say because uh, this process has several advantages as well because it's all happened in one unit but at the same time in order to design this uh, cpp is uh, quite a tedious task or it, it requires a lot of um, uh, skills actually yeah there is a video about uh, lignocellulose yeah so i can try to show you i don't know whether the video can play it but uh, let me try that video was about a uh, little bit uh, giving a uh, detail about one of our current project uh, that goes with the different sugar platforms and uh, producing ethanol uh, but i think yeah later i can share some of these uh, links uh, in the chat box so that uh, you can go through the videos yeah so let's uh, get into yeah because now i think uh, overall we have seen a bit about this um, what is the waste and biorefinery and stuff like that and i think it can, we can divide that into uh, different aspects so one is like a lignocellulose biorefinery and food waste biorefinery and algal biorefinery but i may not go into algal biorefinery i guess because uh, you have had enough a lot of algal uh, technologies has been um, discussed so i will try to focus a bit on the lignocellulose biorefinery and then the waste biorefinery yeah this is what uh, lignocellulose uh, biomass uh, basically available uh, because uh, it is the second uh, abundant in the earth because of this uh, wood and others so basically this is the structure of uh, lignocellulose i think probably you might know a lot because it's typically com comprised of to 50% of uh, cellulose but it's also based on the plants and something kind of like that sometimes it can go even up to 70% and everything so uh, basically this is uh, combines into a moiety so whereas the lignin yeah the cellulose and hemicellulose is kind of covered by lignin so that's why we need a kind of a good amount of a pre treatment in order to get those sugars outside because we focus mainly on the sugars especially for the chemicals and others but then recently we also focus much more on to the lignin valorization where we try to valorize the lignin into also various chemicals and everything because now uh, lignin is also one of the um, interesting component which has more than thousands of uh, different chemicals and stuff like that so yeah when we are just uh, thinking about uh, lignocellulose so the major idea goes into these uh, agricultural sectors so you can see that the what are the countries that mainly focus on the agricultural but i mean it's a huge amount especially in europe there is a huge amount of agricultural aspects goes around and then of course india is also one of the major agricultural sector and in south america and everything so this slide shows you somehow um, uh, fractions about different uh, countries uh, what is the maximum amount of uh, the waste is produced uh, based on uh, the agricultural activities and everything so for example in india almost like um, the agriculture sector 653 million tons uh, per year so it's a quite huge so we can try to develop a lot of uh, products from there yeah so based on this recently uh, with one of my collaborator professor rajesh uh, from uh, central university of tamil nadu so we have got a project with this mission innovation scheme in uh, 2018 so it's uh, because of covid it was supposed to finish by this year but it has expanded for another one year so we have been waiting for a kind of a pilot scale operation but this is what the major a uh, concept that we have uh, developed so because uh, india has a huge amount of agricultural sectors so we have taken a lot of uh, um, lignocellulose biomass and then we try to then to develop a very cost effective uh, pre treatment method because i was mentioning that uh, the pre treatment is the key step especially for this um, uh, getting this uh, cellulose and other compounds and then we try to develop uh, hydrogen and methane and further we also try to develop as i was mentioning from the lignin components we also tend to develop a lot of uh, polyhydroxy alkylates or other polymers yeah so this is an overall scheme that uh, we have got funded and it is ongoing and i'm just going to share some of the results that uh, Uh, we have got uh, from this so because based on this um, uh, pre treatment that we have used a lot of this uh, the phase separation uh, dispersal pre treatment and it has increased uh, quite a good amount of uh, biodegradability later in the process actually so here this is the dispersal treatment you can see that the, this is the fraction so it has quite a clear fraction it has uh, given so we try to do the delignification using the dispersal as well as we also combine along with uh, some kind of uh, agents in order to improve uh, much more into the lignocellulose biorefinery so you can see the instrument and why we just try to use that because it is also have a very less amount of uh, specific energy input but it increases the quite uh, good amount of uh, lignin solubilization and others uh, basically we focused more on the rice straw because which is quite a kind of a 
available uh, material in our region, especially in South. So yeah, you can see this is the paper published in uh, Green Chemistry last year with the, on that. So it is kind of a profitable. So we also did a lot of uh, uh, cost-effective analysis based on the energy input and also the energy output that we can get it from that. So I was mentioning about this, some other chemicals. So we also added along with the hydrogen peroxide H2O2 in order to increase the uh, solubilization of uh, lignin along with this uh, dispersor. So we combined the energy together and trying to calculate how much it and we did a kind of a techno-economic analysis and it has given a quite um, efficient values and everything as you can see and then the, this is the recent paper so we also trying to combine with ultrasonication mainly these are all the mechanical pretreatments that has been uh, implemented and uh, it has given a quite good amount of lignin solubilization and as i was mentioning that uh, yeah i think many of people are focused a bit on the hydrogen and methane so i'm just focusing a bit on the uh, lignin polymerization, what did we do? So based on the uh, lignin fraction that we get, we try to use that lignin fraction to produce uh, polyhydroxy alkalinates, which is the precursor for the bioplastics. And I think some authors were also before giving some talks about bioplastics. I think this is uh, timely needed, not only for India, but also in the whole world, actually. So we started to tend to isolate various um, uh, bacterial populations and others. So here are some results that we have uh, calculated, we got, and then we got quite good results of uh, quite good accumulation of uh, PHA concentration using the lignin. And uh, further, we also try to, because uh, some uh, Fractions. We also need to go much more into the liquefaction of the process with the lignin. So we try to use that for a, mainly this was focused for the ana, uh, anaerobic digestion for the main after the, uh, the hydrolysis the, for the uh, cellulose rich fraction. We try to tend to use a different kind of uh, methodologies. So, so may, uh, we also focused more on the biological liquefaction because uh, it is quite cost effective, but also it is quite um, what to say like uh, in, in terms of uh, not producing much inhibitors. So that was the reason. So these are all different kind of um, bacterial strains that we have isolated and they have different kind of activities. Uh, for example, protease activities mainly for the fraction of uh, protein and amylase activities mainly for the starch because you know cellulose is one form of starch and everything and cellulases and others. Yeah, here is a, a cellulose a, a excreting bacteria and then uh, this is a recent paper we got on how it has impacted and it has given us uh, quite uh, good results about this uh, cellulose rich substrate and how it has impacted on the increased amount of uh, cellulose. And this is an overall scheme. Uh, this is the recent paper from which we, are, which we are going to submit it to sustainable chemistry and engineering. And then yeah, as I was mentioning about this uh, consolidated uh, bioprocessing, it has given us quite good values with the soluble COD and it uh, impacted in directly in the biomethane enhancement. Yeah, so this is uh, the results which mentioned about this biofuel. The previous one was uh, PHA, but then uh, as I was saying, the consolidated uh, process, it has given a uh, quite good values in both terms of biomethane and as well as biohydrogen. So here you can see the mass and the energy economic analysis. As you can see, the with the one uh, we took almost like a one ton of. Uh, if we, I mean, we did it in a lab scale, but then if you are uh, putting it into terms of um, the large scale operations, and this is the overall energy that uh, might be needed. Uh, for the um, uh, rice straw delignification and everything. And then further, this lignin fractions can be used for the PHA. And we compare the current PHA value in the market and everything. So you can see this is the overall uh, net energy production that we could get based on the energy input that we put and uh, the output we could uh, generate. So it is uh, resulted in a quite uh, positive. Uh, way. So that's why the, the cost is you can see the most of our values are in the positive. So that's why this project is quite good. But then we don't know exactly because it is all in the lab scale. But when we are trying to go into the uh, pilot scale operation, then uh, probably the things might be changing. But then uh, due to these COVID issues and others, we couldn't get into the pilot scale. Uh, but we will soon start the pilot scale operations. And then probably in some other occasion, I could try to share much more details about this um, the pilot scale operation and this is the overall scheme about the pilot scale that we have been uh, planning to do that yeah there is a video as well uh, okay but this uh, video is also available in uh, youtube uh, about the overall uh, process of it so i can just give this and then the later the links can be just shared in the chat so you can go through yeah 
So this is the partners uh, in this uh, particular project. So the principal investigator from Indian side is uh, Dr. Rajesh, and the copia is also from Anna University. And then uh, yeah, we are we have uh, currently like seven partners, and uh, from uh, Eastern, I mean uh, from the Scandinavia and the UK, it's me and uh, Dr. Vinod, and also we have uh, collaborators from uh, US and then China. And then Saudi Arabia, and then I think Eldon Rene was a partner from Netherlands. But I think you also might have listened to his talk, I think two days ago, about this uh, waste gas streams. Yeah, so the major uh, conclusions that uh, we have obtained from this study is that the phase separation is the very um, energy saving operating methodology that can be implemented in order to pr produce a more bio energy. Yeah, so then the second uh, topic that I would uh, get into is this uh, food based uh, based biorefineries. As I said, that the lignocellulose was there. And then the, with the food based, because it is uh, rising into a huge uh, problematic, because one of the major problem with the food based, it's it's generated in a huge, it's especially somehow related to our culture as well. For example, in Europe, uh, most of the time when you are going into a restaurant, you may tend to leave some food but then uh, basically for example in norway if you are leaving a food you are supposed to pay a kind of a fine in some other restaurants actually so you are supposed to get back into home and also here uh, it is um, uh, extraordinarily expensive for the food so most of the people they don't tend to waste the food in uh, restaurants and others but whereas in most of the uh, developing economies it it is more or less into kind of a status issue that they, they tend to waste a lot of food, especially in the Middle East. So that's why we also quite uh, collaboratively work with the Qatar and Oman and Middle East, especially on dealing with the food waste. The, that is the first thing with the cultural issue. So it's uh, generated in a huge amount. But at the same time, you can think that there are many people dying without food. So it's, it's a little bit into the... Uh, the uh, ethical issue of that. But anyhow, when coming into the technological issue, the major issue with the food waste is about that uh, the the fraction or the composition of the food waste varies quite largely. For example, in uh, Asia or something, we tend to go much more with the rice-based um, uh, stuff, so, so that the food waste mainly comprised of a lot of carbohydrates. Actually, for example, if you're just seeing an example of uh, USA or in Europe, it is much more into the bread based uh, um, uh, food consumption. So it has a huge amount of uh, protein fractions, actually. So we have to do a little bit of um, different process for that uh, to apply for this. So, for example, you can see that, um, yeah. Uh, approximately 1.3 billion tons in UK is wasted and which could cost about like 750 billion dollars. So it's it's a huge, yeah, 40 million tons in 2013, the highest wastage rate in Europe. Uh, so it is also quite huge um, even in uh, Scandinavia. So uh, this can be a very huge source um, for producing a lot of things. So basically it can also do the same, fuels, uh, chemicals and bioplastics. And we are working on another interesting project about this one and uh, the video was uh, yeah it's still in youtube i think i will just add the link as i was mentioning but also i think we uh, have published a book uh, recently uh, in last year it's uh, food waste to valuable resources uh, if you get a chance so please get into the lco shop and um, you can get into know a lot of uh, details about these uh, projects that uh, what are the proposed methodologies that we are proposing and everything in this book yeah so what would be the ultimate approach uh, with this is this, uh, you know, we have to think a little bit more into the uh, aspect of uh, integrating all these uh, biotechnological approaches, you know. Yeah, that's what I say, like the food waste or lignocellulose and everything we are trying to use into kind of uh, trying to get into, first of all, acidogenic fermentation. And as uh, we found out that actually that this um, acidogens or I mean this uh, volatile fatty acids can be a very rich source in uh, using it into various uh, processes for various products and everything. So this could be the conclusion that we could think slightly into the terms of uh, waste biorefineries. We have to think much more into integrative approach of the one and then the biotechnology can be the a, a major tool that could be used to deal with this uh, waste biorefineries towards a lot of uh, green resources. Yeah. So here, as I was mentioning in the beginning of my uh, presentation, that uh, getting into the, you know, I was mentioning a bit about like the people tend to consume a huge amount of uh, uh, coffee. Uh, because of the dark and uh, stuff like that. So then I also said that uh, our university is mainly focusing a bit on the challenge-based uh, education on that. So so that's why uh, basically in our lab, we try to focus a bit on this uh, 
uh, biorefinery aspect of this uh, spent coffee grounds. I think just to give you an example, I think uh, probably in India also the coffee culture is uh, booming a lot, especially in the city sites. So this is the coffee waste that you get it uh, after you get the cup of coffee, like a espresso or a cappuccino or whatever the case. So almost uh, 60% of the coffee is uh, wasted, coffee bean is wasted when you are doing this uh, process. So here is uh, a few statistics about, yeah, sorry. Here are a few statistics about it. So after all, the coffee is the second largest uh, traded commodity after the oil. And then um, in a day, because as I said, uh, we are now almost like 8 billion people. And then uh, 4.9 billion cups of coffee has been consumed uh, every day worldwide. So it's a quite a huge amount. So you can imagine how much uh, huge the coffee waste that could be generated or something. Uh, in UK, they are just... Um, putting a tax uh, rate of uh, 85 pounds uh, per ton, but this is for overall uh, the landfill actually. And you can see that in um, it's also almost ending up into 9 million tons of uh, coffee waste um, consumed and also it's uh, ending up into the landfill. A huge amount is uh, ended in the landfill. So uh, here I have said that why it was a bit interesting for Norway. Uh, yeah, I think from the, the previous slide that you can understand that if you are going to consume like one kilogram of uh, coffee bean, then you are going to end up almost like a 600 grams of waste. So that's quite huge. Yeah, and it, it has a lot of organic carbon, but there are also some fractions like a phenolic compounds that has to be dealt with. But still, there's a huge amount of organic carbon that can be utilized further. So I said this is the interesting fact that why we focused a bit on Norway, as I mentioned in the household, and Norway also produces a huge amount of waste. So you can imagine that almost uh, Finland is leading in the world uh, for the coffee consumption. It's almost 11.9 kilograms per capita, but then also Norway is in the second largest. It's almost like uh, 9 kilograms per capita, 8.63. So it's quite huge. Uh, yeah, it's the same with the Denmark and uh, you know Austria. Like uh, yeah, Denmark and Austria is more like uh, yeah, German based. So that's why yeah, so huge amount has been generated. So that's why we were a bit interesting to know that okay, why the household? Because they have only two major waste in the household. One is the food waste, and also this is a coffee waste. So this is going to be a huge problem. Even the population is less, the consumption is quite high. So our lab or our team, we started to focus more onto this uh, particular waste. And then we have a typical, some analysis about uh, how much the oil it can contain up to 35% and then the protein up to 35% as well. And then the quite less in carbohydrate, but it's also, and uh, this uh, composition also varies very widely. For example, here I give uh, different examples of uh, coffee processing. Uh, for example, this is a kind of a filter coffee. So when you are just using a simple filter, whereas this coffee waste contains a lot of oil because there was no pressure or there was no something applied um, in the process so that it has uh, accumulated more lipid in the waste actually. But whereas if you go into this one is a uh, espresso machine, right? So if you have seen in espresso machine, there's a kind of a steam, you know, like it's, um, that is the kind of a pretreatment that gives the pressure so that the some amount of uh, oil is actually uh, extracted into the coffee. That's why when you get a coffee in a uh, machine, it looks a little bit of uh, viscous. It's a little bit of oily. It's because of some lipid fraction is also in there. But then whereas you get a filter coffee, it's very clear in terms, it looks like a water. Yeah. So that's why the composition also varies based on the process that we have been doing. So just to give you guys an example or just an imaginary that uh, how big this uh, problem or this uh, coffee waste is that. Mm, uh, I think this is the China Wall, the Great China Wall. I think, I don't know any of you have been there or not. It's quite huge. So if you're just considering only in terms of Starbucks, okay? So the Starbucks capsule is about like 340 grams for each capsule. And then like, I mean, it also goes with the uh, different sizes, but it's an average. And then uh, if you're just collecting the coffee waste only from the Starbucks, and then you can actually get into the, you can use that if you are just considering that into building a build, uh, blocks of that. So you can build uh, walls up to 21.2 million meters. So this can actually surround almost 15 times of this uh, wall so that you can imagine. So it's that much huge amount of uh, uh, coffee waste is uh, generated uh, in there. So so that's why we focused uh, more on to that. And then what are the researches that we have developed and what are the courses that uh, we are doing is uh, mainly we trying to use that uh, protein fraction of the coffee waste into the uh, fish feed because um, I was giving an example of this oil and gas industry in Norway, but there's a huge other industry also in uh, Scandinavia, which is the aquatic industry. But I think even now all over the world, the people enjoy the um, Scandinavian salmon. So Norway is one of the largest producer of uh, salmon. So they, they try, yeah. So we're trying to extract some amount of protein or we are trying to convert some amount of protein from the waste into uh, fish feed. 
because now they try to get a lot of fish feed uh, from brazil from soy basically so that's also another environmental concern that the people are thinking about it but that can be replaced and then mm, we can uh, think about trying to develop a lot of uh, biopolymers which can get into these uh, oil and uh, gas industries or bioplastic that can be developed into all of that so the major of that this mainly entering into the activities of uh, recycling activities and also we try to develop some kind of technology and then transferring into the small medium and Enterprises and we do a lot of this uh, SWOT analysis in each terms of uh, any technology we are proposing and everything just to know about you know what are the strength, weakness, and the opportunities or threat that the technology can bring into that. So here some of the research activities uh, that uh, we also do in our lab. So with the coffee waste, so we try to produce a lot of biochar and everything, using it for energy and other applications, which is quite uh, hot and trendy. And we also try to produce a kind of uh, polymers and others from that that I said. And then uh, one of our students is also working on uh, some uh, sensor materials related to that and just to give you an example in uh, 2019 so it's almost like uh, this much amount of 47 millions of uh, uh, coffee has been consumed and which actually corresponds to 1.8 million tons of uh, carbon emissions so that's also huge so what is the other impact that uh, we have done is that uh, yeah, this is one of our master's uh, group project that uh, the people come with up an, uh, another idea that uh, why don't we use the coffee waste to, to grow mushroom and everything. Of course, there are so many challenges that did about that. But then uh, finally, they succeeded with the um, project. And uh, OK, this is a news about um, uh, how to use the coffee waste into a fuel with my master's student. It has been highlighted in some uh, newspaper. So this is more or less about this uh, waste biorefinery and this uh, circular economy aspect of it but then as i was mentioning in the previous uh, i mean i mentioned in the beginning of this uh, presentation that i will also give a few glimpses about this uh, one health approach yeah now this was another aspect of our uh, department or our uh, faculty that we are mainly focusing on that so which combines the circular economy and also into the resource recovery things uh, together so as you can see that we're trying to focus on a kind of a circular society whereas the health and everything of the whole society is more important as well. Yeah, so these are all the major other activities that we do in our uh, department, antimicrobial resistance uh, under gene transfer and wastewater treatment and plant that is uh, directly corresponding to this One Health because especially now with this uh, COVID, there's a huge amount of uh, viral particles and others emerging in the wastewater treatment itself. So we have to really think about much more into that, especially in terms of infection, disinfections we are using and other tablets and so on. So kind of like that and then the recirculation reuse of water and uh, recovery of waste and uh, wastewater valuables that we are doing and then this uh, novel antibiotics uh, this has been highlighted in science news uh, now recently one of my colleague uh, called the magne uh, trying to work out on a kind of uh, uh, light emitting antibiotics which is quite easier to identify especially when you are thinking in terms of um, what is it like in terms of wastewater treatment and others yeah, so then other project that we are working is uh, trying to combining these uh, algal ponds uh, along with this uh, wastewater treatment so that it's much more easier. But then uh, the interesting factor with this uh, project is that we're trying to focus much more on these dissolved methane that is has been dissolved in the anaerobic uh, reactor, which could be further utilized into terms of uh, photogranules with the uh, algal ponds. And we can uh, try to think about it. Yeah. Uh, this is more or less about our projects and others. If you wanted to learn much more about our research work and others into these uh, bioeconomy aspects, you can just uh, please follow those links. And then um, uh, you can also, uh, and uh, finally, uh, I would like to thank my um, uh, collaborators and uh, my postdocs and others in both in Yonza University as well as in uh, University of Stavanger and the funding agencies uh, for giving me an opportunity to run these aspects. And uh, finally, I thank the organizers and everybody. And uh, here is my email ID if you have any questions. And then uh, this is uh, the field next to our university. So if in case future, if you get a chance to visit uh, Stavanger, yeah, we could um, meet here as well. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity. And uh, since I have a faculty meeting, since I was mentioning this uh, last day, I can spare another 10 minutes. If you have any questions to answer for it, then I have to rush into the meeting. Thank you for your very informative session, sir, and taking us an international international perspective of biomass. Thank you very much. Sir. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, all the best for everybody. Thank you so much. Sir.